His is one of the most storied names in Canadian business, Bronfman. The family's Seagram Company was once the largest distiller of alcoholic beverages in the world. And helping run that family business was just part of the fascinating life of billionaire philanthropist and former owner of the Montreal Expos, Charles Bronfman. His memoir, written with Howard Green, was a finalist for this year's National Business Book Award. It's called Distilled, a memoir of family, Seagram, baseball, and philanthropy. And we're pleased to welcome Charles Bronfman on the line from New York, New York, to our program tonight. Great to meet you, Mr. Bronfman. How are you? I wish I was in person, uh, Steve, but uh, we'll take it as it is for now. Excellent. You have been a public figure for so very long, and you say in the book, so I'm not telling tales out of school here, you're 85 years old now. Why at this stage of your life have you decided it's finally time to tell some stories about your life? Well, I didn't think I'd wait till I was 95. <laughs> you know, things can happen then. And uh, <laughs> realistically, I did want my grandchildren to really, really know who their pops was. That's how it all started. And then uh, one thing led to another, and I said, hey, this is rather an impressive kind of a life I've been leading, which I hadn't ever thought about very much. And uh, then uh, Howard Green and I got together, and the rest, uh, as they say, is either his story or her story or our story. <laughs> well, but, uh, it, your father, of course, was the legendary Sam Bronfman, who owned Seagram. And I, I want to start with a bit of an exploration into your relationship with him. You're the youngest of his four kids. And you tell us, quote, I fell in love with my father after he died. He was no longer a threat to me. That's a most interesting way to put your relationship. What did you mean by that? I, really exactly what, what I said. Uh, I always did love him. I was never in love with him because I was scared of him, as we all were. He had this very violent temper uh, that everybody knew about, uh, which he never used on me, by the way, but I saw him use it on others. And so you're terrified that one day he might, this, this great storied man might turn on you. And that was sort of very scary and, and sort of put up somewhat of a barrier. But I loved him. I, th I thought he was a great, great human being. Well, it's interesting that despite growing up the way you did, obviously with, with privilege that you acknowledge, you also tell us in the book that you, you found you lacked a great deal of confidence. Why do you think that was? Oh, heck, I guess there are many, many reasons for these things. Uh, because I think I was the youngest and sort of, I was a pretty sickly little kid. Uh, and I was the youngest and I, I just didn't seem to have what my siblings had. Uh, my number one sister, who I loved dearly, Minda, uh, was always getting gold stars at school. Phyllis could do anything she wanted. She was a rebel and did her thing. Edgar was tougher and bullyish, and I was a skinny little guy. <laughs> so I didn't have much going for me. You will, <laughs> or I didn't think I did. <laughs> you will forgive me for putting this next question this way, but, but, I mean, you do touch on it in the book, so I think I'm on okay ground here. What is it like to grow up, in some respects, completely disconnected from reality? Well, you don't know about it because you don't know what reality is, so, you know, it, you're there. Well, you tell us that, you know, you lived in Montreal and never heard any French spoken in your daily life ever and didn't even know it was spoken in the surrounding areas. I mean, how's that possible? Uh, because if you ever read Hugh McLennan's book, Two Solitudes, I think you'd know. Okay. There was a really sharp dividing line. I gotcha. How difficult was it to grow up knowing that there were going to be a lot of people out there who, regardless of whatever you were able to personally achieve in your life, they would always say, yeah, of course, he's Sam Bronfman's son. What do you expect? That really didn't bother me. It bothered my brother a lot. Edgar. Uh, yeah, but it didn't bother me very much. Why do you figure? You know, I, sort of, I, I sort of just sloughed it up because I think he was competing with our father. I never was. Because you were the younger one. Maybe because I was the younger one, but because <laughs> maybe I said, well, what's the point in competing? This, he did it all, and uh, we're going to bask in his glory or we'll screw it up, hmm. and that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> One of the biggest stories, of course, around your family was the accusation during Prohibition times that your father was, quote, unquote, a bootlegger. And again, you talk about this in the book, that he was mightily offended whenever anybody would suggest that of him. How come? 
uh, I, he was always put upon by this accusation of being a bootlegger. Now, was he, wasn't he? I'm not quite sure. And why them and why not the Hatches and why not the Molsons and the Labats and so on? I, I really know none of that. Uh, I only know that uh, he was very, very sensitive and it bothered him all his life. Well, let me draw an inference here, and you tell me if I'm off base. You know, the Labats and the Molsons and all of them were, quote, unquote, you know, fine old Canadian families, very, uh, you know, waspy, and yours was a Jewish family. Yours is a Jewish family. Do you think there was a little anti-Semitism at play here? Oh, heck, probably. But uh, once again, you know, we can decide everything is as we want it to be. Uh, I don't know why it was anti-Semitism, sure, and jealousy had, had to do with it. But uh, I remember one time when I met Cliff Hatch, finally, we had a, a business discussion, and uh, I said, Cliff, you know, your father and my father hated each other unbelievably, but my goodness, it was a profitable uh, uh, hatred. And so the two of us laughed, and eventually uh, Cliff and I became pretty good friends. This is uh, Hatch, who was a competitor, and, and uh, I guess the guy right. responsible for uh, Canadian so, Club. I, uh, and hire Walker Goodman works, yes. Right. Let's get into some exploration of your relationship with your brother, which you talk about in the book. And to do that, I will, um, I'll read a quote here from your book. Edgar and I used to take the streetcar on Sundays to go to Montreal Royals baseball doubleheaders, and we would also go to hockey games together. He would uh -huh. bet with me, but against the Montreal Canadiens. I'd say, how the hell can you bet against the Canadiens? It's our team. <laughs> Pointing to his heart and then to his wallet, he said, this money has nothing to do with this, the heart, and that's the difference between you and me. Do you think the fact that he made that grander distinction between head and heart, which you did not make, made him a better businessman than you? Could be. Could very well be. Because to me, the heart and the head have to go together. Now, he ran Seagram's from head office in New York, and you stayed in Montreal. Of course, most of the business was being done in New York, and I wonder whether you right. felt at the time, even though you two were supposed to be running the business together, that you felt somewhat marginalized in that effect. Uh, we weren't supposed to run the business together. We had equal shareholding, uh, but that didn't mean that in management we were meant to be together one way or the other, because when he wanted to go to New York, I said, fine, I did not want to run a major corporation. I don't think I'd want to run one today. I think I could have probably been fairly good at it, not as a COO, but as a CEO. Hmm. Uh, Edgar had uh, um, great passion for thrusting forward. I was sort of a reticent type of a fellow, and I was very happy to lay back. I was scared like hell of New York. Uh, I loved being in Montreal, I loved being in Canada, and I didn't want to go anywhere, hmm. just that simple. I know you say this in the book, but I do want to confirm it right here tonight again. You found out that Seagram was going to be passed to Edgar Jr. by reading it in a magazine. Is that right? You got it. And when you did read that in the magazine, <laughs> how much steam came out of your ears? Well, it was sort of, I was incredulous, of course. Uh, you hadn't talked to it, Edgar it was, about it before that? No. No, we never discussed uh, succession at all. <laughs> I must admit, I, I, you know, you see what you want to see, and I probably didn't want to see certain things. Hmm. But, you know, one has to uh, say to, at the end of the day, there, there must have been a lot of reasons. And to tell you the truth, uh, right now, I'm more interested in the future than the past. The past was, I think, the past. There were some very uh, difficult uh, eras in the past and some very happy ones. I so I'm not going to concentrate on the bad. I, I appreciate that, but uh, I hope you're going to indulge me a little bit because I got a few more questions on this part of your biography, which is autobiography, oh, which, is, which is quite fascinating. Well, I got to tell you, it, it is because this is kind of the first time that you've really put all in one place your thoughts about Edgar Jr.'s running of your family business, which, of course, at, at a key moment involved divesting the company of $9 billion almost worth of DuPont shares, which was incredibly profitable, although maybe not all that sexy a business. He wanted to turn the company into a, a media conglomerate. And I, I wonder when he presented that to the board, what was your initial reaction to it? Well, we had talks about it well before uh, it went to the board. 
Uh, it was really a, a case of two against one. Uh, it was my brother and my nephew, his son, against me. And uh, I come up with various alternatives to what they wanted to do. And they kept on saying no, and I had a choice to go to the board and, uh, and fight, or do I realize that they're really not going to uh, uh, ruin the business? I was wrong on that one. Uh, and I chose not to go to the board because, among other things, it would have caused a family fight, a family war. Nobody wins in a family war, including the shareholders. So uh, I opted to uh, eventually to go along. You took a big one for the team there, and of course, Edgar Jr. got hooked up with Vivendi and with this other CEO who was a bit of a megalomaniac, I think is putting it generously, and because of that deal, I'm fast forwarding here, of course, your family ended up losing Seagram's. And I'm wondering, even to this day, many years later, how much that still hurts. It'll hurt until they put me underground. And I think it hurts all of us, all of us. Uh, I do not speak very often to uh, Edgar Jr., and I never discuss this subject with him, but certainly uh, his siblings and uh, the next generation on his side, and certainly my siblings, and uh, I can't say their kids are too young, uh, but it hurts all of us, no question. Your brother Edgar, of course, died a few years ago. Could, could you have written this book as candidly as you have if he were still alive? You know, I once, uh, when I was at TCS in Port Hope, I once heard a great sermon done by a wonderful guy, the Reverend E.R. Bagley, who said, if is the biggest word in the English language. Hmm. So all I can do is answer, I, I don't know. <laughs> I wrote it now. I, I've thought about it, by the way. It would have been difficult, but I think I would have done it. Okay, let's talk about one of the things that you and I both love a great deal, and that is baseball. You were one of the driving forces to bring the Montreal Expos to that city, and you say in the book that it changed your life. How so? Well, because for the first time in my life, I did something on my own without the umbrella of my family or its money. Uh, it was me uh, and uh, either go do it or sink, sink or swim. So fortunately, we swam. You sure it was did. A great experience. It was really the first time in my life that I, I had some real self-confidence. I remember well your courting the great budding superstar Reggie Jackson to come to Montreal, brought him up to the house, showed him around, introduced him to folks. He, of course, ended up spurning your offer and going to New York, where he became a legend in his own time and mind. Uh, what was it like to deal with Reggie? Well, I really didn't negotiate with Reggie. Uh, John McHale, our president, and my dear friend Leo Colber uh, negotiated with him. John uh, had an expression which he gained uh, after many years of trying to sign baseball players. He said, if you don't sign him, when he walks out of the room, he's gone. And we did not sign Reggie when he walked out of the room. So uh, as, as Steinbrenner said, uh, Bronfman may have Seagram's and Kroc may have McDonald's, but I got the Big Apple. <laughs> and he was right, and, and he was right. Well, you offered him more money, but that is true. He, he offered him Broadway. Yes, and, and he offered him also <clears throat> all the endorsements that he could have. Mm -hmm. How emotionally difficult was it for you eventually, given the differential in the Canadian and the American dollar and the problems with the stadium and so on, uh, for you to eventually sell the Expos and have them move to Washington after that? There is a, <laughs> an old expression, <clears throat> same with a yacht as with a, a, a sports team. The two happiest days are the days you buy and the days you sell. Uh, you finally, you know, it wasn't my main business. And uh, after 22 years, and the last seven of them being very difficult, uh, we had problems with the Blue Jays over television rights. I had troubles with the commissioner's office on Bowie Kuhn's uh, decision on that subject. We had uh, uh, lots of uh, player relationship problems. We had the problems with Quebec, with the, uh, with the stadium, and the fact that it just wasn't a baseball stadium. And finally, it just sort of grates on you. We also had some pretty darn good little uh, teams of, of these young kids really, really playing their hearts out. 
and you have 7,000 people in the stadium, and it, it got to be just too much, too much, too much. Hmm. So it was not that difficult. Uh, we felt badly, we felt sad, but uh, when we sold, well, we, we said, okay, that's it. Well, you know better than anybody that, uh, of course, there are huge efforts being undertaken, led, I might say, by your son, Stephen, to get a baseball team back in Montreal. Do you think those will pay off? I have absolutely no idea. Are you involved in it's it at all? Very, uh, Stephen and I speak about it once in a while, but uh, I, I am uh, not taking any active role at all. I've been there, done that, if he wants to do that, and he can figure out how to do it. God bless him. If he can't, okay. Okay. Let's. Uh, but, there, but there are lots of there are lots of mitigating forces in that kind of a situation. For sure. Uh, let's talk about something that has really animated your life over the last several years, and that is philanthropy, which you describe as not altruism. It's closer, you say, to narcissism. What do you mean by that? Well, I don't believe that anybody does anything, uh, be it in uh, philanthropy or anything else in which they have absolutely no interest, no ego interest, or no uh, climbing the social ladder interest, or uh, gee, this will make my reputation uh, look much better kind of interest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, let's talk a bit about what you have done. Your foundation has, uh, I guess, inspired the creation uh, because of your interest in promoting Canadian history of those Canadian Heritage Minutes, which everybody has seen right. either in the theaters or on television or whatever. Why are those so important to you? Because uh, I have always felt that in a society, uh, there must be heroines, heroes, and myths. And to me, in Canada, we didn't have those. And I spent a lot of time in the United States where love of country is the true religion. In Canada, it wasn't. And uh, I said, this is sort of uh, unfortunate because how can you have a country, a nation, a, uh, a society without having those bare essentials of heroines, heroes, and myths? Hmm. And uh, uh, so we started them and they, they took off right away. It was great. They sure have been popular, that's for sure. You have donated, of course, as a, uh, as a prominent Jewish Canadian to many Jewish causes. You're a strong supporter of the state of Israel. You were actually, you tell us in the book, at the White House in 1993 when Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat and Bill Clinton had that three-way handshake and, and almost a peace treaty. I wonder, though, as I was reading the book, whether you feel less close to Israel today because the prime minister of the country is not somebody whose politics you are simpatico with. Oh, dear. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, look, I can love Canada. I might not love the government uh, in office at the moment. That's the same with Israel. I love the Jewish people, uh, and I might not like the uh, the prime minister of the day, but there will be another prime minister. There will be another government. There will be people who maybe see the, the two-state solution uh, in the Middle East with the Palestinians and the Israelis is a must. It's not an if or an as or a when. It's a must. Uh, and I will hold true to those principles as long as I'm alive. You have uh, told us that so far in your life, and I say so far because you're a long way from done, you've donated $325 million to various philanthropic causes, and you tell us, I think, that you're intending to give away the majority of your wealth before you're all said and done. How come? Oh, because it, I, I was frankly doing that anyway, and I did want to join the, the giving pledge that uh, Bill Gates uh, uh, formed. Uh, it's a very good organization. I think what it does is it says to wealthy people, look, you made a lot of money. Uh, you've got to be part of the totality of the, of the social uh, uh, ethos of the country. And uh, by giving away a lot of what you have, that's a very good way to go. Hmm. Mr. Bronfman, you've done a lot with your life. Is there anything still on that bucket list of yours that you haven't done? Well, yeah, I think the, the last one you touched on, the, uh, the peace in the Middle East. Uh, I, I am convinced that nothing will happen to any uh, positive degree in that region of the world until 
the Israelis and the Palestinians make some form of an arrangement that the rest of the world can applaud. And certainly the other Arab nations will not do anything positive until that happens. Hmm. So that's, that's my uh, uh, hope to uh, do work on for the next 10 years. And I hope it doesn't take that long. Let's, uh, let's leave the interview on this last question here. When you go into somebody's home or a restaurant or a bar and you see a bottle of Chivas Regal, what do you think? Oh dear, a lot of, you know, you know darn well, you phrased the question well, conflicting thoughts. You know, a sort of wonderful, terrible. <laughs> and uh, it, it was, uh, it was, I remember by the way when dad uh, was gonna do Chivas Regal. He thought that, because uh, he had all this thing with the crowns and the royalty and so on, that people would come in and ask for a regal. And of course they didn't, they asked for Chivas. Yes. Uh, but that was his thing of the regality and, and the high esteem and so on. And uh, he, was a, he was a great and very wise human being. Miss him a lot. Well, I have to tell you how much I enjoyed your book. I'm only sorry we had to do this over satellite. I look forward to actually shaking your hand someday, and I would certainly urge anybody who's interested to read Distilled, a memoir of family, Seagram, baseball, and philanthropy. Charles Bronfman, great to talk to you on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Great to be with you, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.